am starting a new series of videos on classical physics where I would be covering the entire course of classical physics, the most important and vital concepts, areas, mathematical calculations and I will be primarily using calculus and I will try to make it as simple as possible. So this is the first video on introduction to classical physics where I would like to show you what are the chapters that I would be covering in the overall series of this video. So this is not what we are covering today but these are the entire course topics that we covered in this series of videos. So I would be starting with kinematics, uh, covering the mathematical descriptions of motion, then I would go to Newton's first and third laws. I would also be covering in depth with Newton's second law, the dynamics of particles, conservation and non-conservation of momentum, work and energy, simple harmonic motion, static equilibrium and simple rigid bodies. And finally, we would conclude learning about rotational motion, angular momentum and dynamics of rigid bodies. Now, this is the entire course topic. So, it would take around 30 to 35 videos for me to complete. And on each of these topics, for, for example, kinematics or conservation or non-conservation, there will be around total of 60 to 70 chapters and sub-chapters. So, you can consider this to be a series of videos covering almost all the areas and topics of uh, uh, classical physics. And if you feel that you need some of the topics which are not being covered, you can let me know in the description box and the comment section. I will definitely try to cover up those topics. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. A warm welcome to this new series of Classical Physics. So first of all, I would like to start with what is called motion in one dimension. Now, in general, classical mechanics deals with the question that how an object moves when it is subject to various forces and also with the question of what forces act on an object which is not moving. Now the word classical indicates that we are not discussing phenomenon on the atomic scale and we are not discussing situations to which an object moves with velocity close to the speed of light which is an applic applicable fraction of the velocity of light. So the description of the atomic phenomena requires quantum mechanics to be covered and the description of the phenomena of high velocities requires Einstein's theory of relativity, which I have got separate videos which you can look into the playlist. Now, both quantum mechanics and relativity were invented by the 20th century. The laws of classical mechanics were stated by Sir Isaac Newton in around 1687. Now, the laws of classical mechanics actually enables us to calculate the trajectories of baseballs and bullets, spaces, vehicles, all those things, and planets as they move around the sun. Uh, using these laws, actually, we can uh, predict the uh, position versus time relation for a cylinder rolling down an inclined plane or maybe an oscillating pe pendulum or we can calculate the tension in the wire when a picture is hanging on a wall. Now, kinematics, which I am starting with, is basically a subfield of physics that describes the motions of points, bodies of, and system of bodies without considering the forces that can cause a move. So, when we are considering what is called a one dimension motion, now let us think of a material object. Let us consider this to be a particle, the red one, which is constrained to move along a given straight line. You can consider it to be an automobile moving along a straight line. Now, if you take some point in the line as an origin, the position of the particle at an instance can be specified by a number, say x. So, which gives the distance from the original of the particle. So, positive values of x are assigned to points on one side of the origin and negative values is assigned to the points on the other side of the origin so that each value of x corresponds to a unique point. Now, which direction is taken as positive or negative is something uh, uh, totally, it is a matter of convention. Now, the new num numerical value of x clearly depends on the length of the unit. For example, if you are using feet, meter or miles. Now, unless the particle is at rest, x will definitely vary with time. So, the value of x at t of time is denoted by xt, as I have shown you right in the screen. The average velocity of particle during the time interval from t to t prime, as we use t prime, is defined as this, right? So, uh, that is the change in position divided by change in time. Now, for example, if we consider this and we draw a graph of x versus t, for example, Okay, yeah, so which direction it is taken is uh, positive, negative is a matter of convention. 
Now considering that we uh, take this one and then what we do is that here it is we draw a graph right x versus t and this is the graph and these are the dotted lines. So we see that this one x t prime minus x t uh, upon t prime minus t is just the slope of the dashed uh, straight line right. We just connecting the points which represent the position of the particles uh, at times t prime at t. Okay, now there is something which is uh, uh, further more important, which is called uh, instantaneous velocity. Like, right? for example, if you can look at the speedometer, which looks like that. Uh, if you hold t fixed, okay, if you hold t fixed and let t prime be closer and closer and closer to t, then the quotient, yeah, if you can hold t equal closer and closer, then the quotient will approach actually uh, approach a definite limiting value. Now, this is actually the concept of limit which is further discussed in calculus. But however, we are what we were doing is that we are holding t fixed and approaching a definite limit uh, t prime to be closer and closer and closer. Now, this limiting value which may be thought of as the average velocity over an infinite single time interval which includes the time t is actually called the instantaneous velocity or we can say like this, right? So, if you are uh, uh, you know aware about uh, this equation, familiar to anyone who has studied calculus, this part, this one, the right hand side is called the derivative of x with respect to t and uh, it is quite often denoted by this one, dx by dt. So, v by d uh, equals to dx by dt. Now, for example, we draw another graph and we get the height as d and t. And this is the kind of a graph that we are covering. So the area of this rectangle, which we are, uh, this one, which we are covering, right, is Vt uh, delta, which is equal to the displacement of the particle during the time interval from t to t plus delta, where delta can be considered as a very small minute chain, right. Now what happens is that if t1 and t2 are, say, for example, two times. If we divide the interval between them into many small intervals, small, 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 small intervals, then the displacement during any sub interval is approximately equal uh, to the area of the corresponding triangle. So let me show you this. Yeah. So we have, I have, we have divided into very small spots. So the net displacement, which is this one, x t sub t minus x t one, is approximately will be equal to the sum of the areas of the rectangles because we have for the subdivided into very small parts. Now, what happens is that if the, we are taking the same one, if the subintervals are made smaller and smaller and further smaller, then the error in this approximation becomes negligible. That means we are subdividing for the purpose that we want to make the error negligible. And we see that the area under the portion uh, of the v, this one, the v versus t curve between t1 and t2, this interval, is equal to the displacement, which is x t two minus x t one, experienced by the particle during that time interval. That is quite obvious. So now, if we use the notation of calculus, we can write it as this. And also, as you know, that the right side is called the integral of v t with respect to t from t one to t two. This is one the integral of v t with respect to t from t one to t two. So, and it actually is defined mathematically as the limit of the sum of the areas of the rectangles. Okay. Now, we move to the next part, which is called acceleration. Now, acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity. We all know the average acceleration during the interval, which we take from t to t prime, can be defined as this, right? I am using a for average, right? Where v t prime and v t2 are basically what we call the instantaneous value of the velocities at times t prime and t, right? Okay, now the instantaneous acceleration is defined as the average acceleration over an infinite single interval of time, which can be shown as this. Now, since we know that dt equals to dx upon dt, we can write using the notation of calculus as at equal to d square x by dt squared, and we this is basically what we call is simply the shorthand of this one d by dt dx by dt. Okay, now here comes a, a very important point which is this one. If you take these two equations, right, 
then we see that the relation between this one, AT and BT, right, is the same as the relation between BT and XT. Okay. Uh, it follows that if uh, if BT is, if you say, for example, if you're taking BT given as the graph, then the so slope of the graph is AT, which somehow looks like this. Okay. So, if AT is given as a graph, then we should expect that the area under the portion of the graph between time T1 and T2 is equal to the change of the velocity, which is VT2 minus T1, VT1, quite obviously. And similarly, this can be written, this equation earlier which we have taken is something which is similar to this. Right? So, this is the way in which we arrive to the uh, formula that if the, comparing these two equations, we get the similar and the change in velocity. So, the earlier equation using uh, uh, the same can be written as this one. Okay, till now we have been looking with something, uh, you know, uh, applies to uh, any one dimensional motion. Now, an important uh, aspect in motion is in which the acceleration is absolutely constant in time. That means it is moving in constant in time. Now, we shall shortly see that this occurs whenever the forces are the same at all times. That is, the graph of this acceleration is that the acceleration is constant in time. So, it, it would look like this. So, the area of this graph between the time 0 and time t is just what we call a multiplied by t. So, we can add uh, this one a multiplied by t. So, from this we can deduce that vt minus v0 obviously will be a t. So, uh, to make uh, our notation the similar, we can make contact with the notation and we write v instead of vt and v0 instead of uh, instead of V within braces 0. So, from here it follows that V will be equals to V0 plus AT. Now, the graph of V versus, uh, you know, is a straight line with slope A, okay, this one. So, what we get from here is that this, this yellow one. So, we can get an explicit, explicit formula for XT by inserting this expression into this expression. So, let us see. So, what we are doing right now is that uh, what what we are doing is that the area under this one, this uh, this figure uh, between t zero and t is the basically the t uh, I would say the width of t multiplied by the height at the midpoint. The so width of t multiplied by height, which gives half of v zero plus plus v zero plus a t. And solving, we find this one, right? And finally, we find this one. You can take a snapshot and you can make a pause if you want. So that you get this one. So this is basically after that we are calculating the area which is highlighted. Now again, okay, yeah. So from there we get to this, uh, this equation that is average this one, and then we can calculate and find out this. Okay. So comparing this equation, so what happens is that I will tell you, uh, yeah. So this equation ultimately would lead to the next. One. Okay, so if we compare these two equations, this one x equal to x0 plus half of this and v equals to average, then what we see is that the average velocity during any time of interval is half the sum of the initial and final velocities. Now, this is approximately true uh, for any special case. So, that is why I am comparing these two equations because it comes to a kind of an almost rule that the any time interval, the average velocity will always be half of the sum of the initial and final velocities. So, except for special cases which we are not considering here. Now, sometimes we are interested in knowing the velocity as a function of the position of x rather than as a function for the position of t. So, if we solve this equation for t, t equals to v minus v0, if we solve uh, this one and substitute the value of this one to this, we get something like this, right? So, we get something like this. So, from here, what we get are a few of the important formulas. Let us see, we get this, which we have already calculated. We are also getting all these uh, four, four formulas. So, what is happening is that, okay, let me go back once more and uh, I will show you, yeah. So, what is happening is that once we have found out this equation x equals to 
x0 plus 1 upon b0 plus b2, then what we get is that using the calculus, we can calculate this one, xt2 minus xt1 and from there we get to this. Okay, this part's portion we have already compared, we have computed this one. Right? So, from here we get to these final formulas, which are uh, very important for further calculations of physics. Okay, so in the next video, what I will be doing is that I will be covering these four topics, motions in two and three dimensions, circular motion using a geometric and analytic method, and motion of a 3D moving body. So, that's it for the initial first part of our discussion on classical physics. We have just started, there are a lot, lot of videos which I will be making and covering all those things one by one. Do let me know how did you like the first video in the comment box and if you have any suggestions, I would like to hear from you. Please subscribe to my channel Physics for Students and click on the bell icon to get all the notifications for Physics for Students. So, this is Seanok signing off from today's video, promising you to be back with another interesting video and this series of classical physics will continue from now on. Thank you very much. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you for watching this video. We appreciate your time and patience. If you want to connect with us and provide further feedback, comment or suggestions, please email us at contact.physicsforstudents at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. See you soon in the next video.